Je ne parle pas très bien français. Okay, hi Derek. Hello. Thanks for, for being here. My pleasure. I do have a theory about you. Every uh, project you've worked on looks fantastic, sounds awesome, and it, turn, it turns into a golden classic. So I think you were born out of a threesome uh, with uh, uh, Da Vinci, Dr. Dre, and uh, King Midas. Am I wrong about this? Uh, well, I, I mean, those losers? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. No, I'm <laughs> King Midas, maybe. I don't know. Pretty <laughs> that, shitty power. That didn't, well, you know, yeah, that, that didn't work out so good for him. He touched, he made gold, but he ruined everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess I have the ability to ruin everything I touch. Uh, <laughs> Alternative. Maybe, maybe that's a, true. A golden classic. No, but I appreciate the compliment. Um, I, don't, well, I, 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 I don't hold myself on such a high level. I'm, uh, I'm just happy other people like my work. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for your work. So, up to this day... This is a serious question. Okay. Ah, don't worry. Uh, Transmetropolitan remained uh, so relevant. Mm. Whether it's for the, the better or, or worse, the beast, the smiler and all this. Uh, how hard would it be to create parody now when reality itself became a parody? That's a really good question in that, um, like I said, I was recently discussing with Warren, like, do you ever want to go back and revisit that world? Would you like to work on this again? Because once upon a time, uh, we imagined uh, we were going to do prequels to Transmetropolitan. We had one called Transoceanic, where spiders on a ship and on a cross ocean voyage for days. And then we had one that was going to be transcontinental and it was like seeing the whole country rather than just the city. Before it was famous? Uh, yes, this is like within the first year when we were creating Transmetropolitan. We, you know, I had asked Warren about it and, and uh, we, we were talking about... Be before Spider Jerusalem became famous for, for, for yeah. his... Uh, no, okay. I mean, it was the first year Transmet when we thought we were... We were just okay. surprised we weren't canceled yet, so... Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, the, the in in the storyline. Oh, the plot line. Yeah, yes. No, line. I'm sorry. I thought you meant in, oh, in our okay. reality. No, it would be before Spider. Yeah, be, before, before his big time. Right. It was his pre. It's prequels to this. So like stories from his past. Okay. So I don't really know what Warren was going to do with those. We never really got into do many details. I started thinking of a plot for Transoceanic, um, based on how crazy things are right now. And the idea was going to be that Spider was going to find himself on one of the... There's, this is true. There's people that um, want to get a huge, giant cruise ship and live on it so they could be a libertarian paradise. No government. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wonder how long that would last, you know. But I thought... Two days. <laughs> but if Spider gets on that boat... <laughs> And, one day <laughs> yeah and then can't find the captain of, you know so um i thought that would be an interesting story but that's about as far but that's an example of how today's craziness uh it, it's still it's it's weirder now than even transmet was at least in transmetropolitan like people cared when spider told the truth people were like spider's telling the truth we have to listen in no reality, it's like everybody would call him fake news. Yeah, fake news or just extremist or he's yeah, where he's he's too he's too this far or too left, that. leftist, fucking leftist. Yeah, call me. Well, it's weird because there are people that think Spider's very right, like very far right, which I don't like. It's they, like Nietzsche. They can project them themselves on him. Yeah, it's like Nietzsche. Some people say it's a right wing philosopher. Some people say, well, right. If you if you think the the Smiler is a you know is is a lefty, then you think Spider is a conservative writer. Of course, if you yeah. think the Beast is Nixon, then you think he's a leftist writer. So I think Spider just doesn't like corruption and lying, you know, and both sides do it. So yeah, it's universal, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so let's get it out of the way right now. Um, if there were to be a Transmetropolitan uh, series, who would you like to see uh, portraying your character? Uh, Tim Roth. I would yeah. like to see Tim. That'd be last my dream. That Has he been bald ever? Has he been bald? Yeah, he was. Uh, he appeared bald in a couple of movies. There's an old movie, um, I don't remember the title, um, but he plays a, a skinhead. Okay, I've never he, seen and that. And he's I walking around without a shirt on, and he's got suspenders and tattoos, and he's bald, and he looks like Spider. I yes. actually put some. I did a little Photoshop fun and, and put glasses on him and oh, yeah? and put a spider on his head just to see. Plus, he got the Light to Me show, which was. Yeah, all about the truth which is great and, and he then, had also a yeah, way of he's, walking he's got a he's got an attitude and uh and then he was in a movie i think it was called far from home or a long way home 
and uh, he plays a guy who gets out of prison, and when he comes out of prison, he's like shaved down, um, and his walk is just—it's just I see spider. Well, I'll try to find it and to embed it in the in the video okay. uh, on me. Um, okay, so let's let's keep our, our finger crossed and send all the energy so that <laughs> that may happen happen one day or, or the other. So one thing, I'll, if it does, we'll talk again. Oh, uh, I'd be pleased. So one thing which is happening right now is the boys is the boys yes. series are you involved in a creative process i am a little bit how cool is it <laughs> it's how amazing. cool is it it's amazing the um i've uh I, i've signed a non-disclosure agreement so i can't say what i've seen or show it to you um but i've uh, done some artwork for the show and i'm in touch with some of the people that are running so it. you have a saying in in what's going on a little bit i mean they're they're well, let me just say i i think this i can say safely they have showed nothing but respect and reverence for the comic amen and like when i everything i've seen so far it shows that they're doing their own thing with it kind of like with preacher um like it's preacher but they made their own changes to it to make it work better as a television show so there are some small adjustments and um But Eric Kripke is running the show, and he's been nothing but kind to me, and he clearly loves the comic. And when he was, we were getting started last, a couple of years ago at San Diego Comic-Con, I met him in person, and we talked, and he asked me, what's important to you? What do you want to see in the show? And I was... Say no more. I was able to tell him, like, I, no this more. is important to me, you know. And, and I hope he, I hope he I, delivers. I saw it in the screenplay. I got to read the screenplay, and I'm like, there's the scene I asked for, so... How excited were you? Oh, it was great. I mean, the whole, it's fantastic. I've, I, this is something I've, I've wanted my whole life. And it was, it's been a crazy ride because The Boys was optioned in 2008. And it's been 10 years of almost happening. It's almost going to happen. It's almost there. And, it's, and then Preacher. Yeah. Well, I mean, they always wanted it. It just that kept moving. Preacher. It just, at Preacher, yeah, I think. Uh, success of Preacher probably helped, but it was always set. It was set up before Preacher, ironically, um, and then it just moved. It was going to be a movie, and then recently it was it was turned into a television show, and then it was going to be on Cinemax, and now it's on Amazon. But Amazon is committed; they're filming. It's happening. <laughs> it's no okay. More, okay. There's no more maybes. It's happening. Okay, great, great. So you have to do a a, a butcher face to Carl Urban's face at the premiere. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Great. <laughs> Some another matter. Let's let's come back to comics. And without artists, a uh, comic book would only be novels. Um, so I really like you know to emphasize how much the artists they they put and add to the mix um, without taking any credits to the to, uh, of of the the, the it, writer. It should never be. I mean, it's a, a team. It's not a competition. No, right. It's That's a, it's it. like a band. It's like you it's know, like a couple. It's like a couple. You have to, you right. build you build those kind of relationship on trust. Yes. So. Um, for example, the creation of Happy. Yes. Can you? What happened at the creation of Happy? How was it Grant's idea to 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 have this blue this blue thing, or did he give you a green yeah, card? Yeah. Like he, a, he had an idea for a little blue horse, and uh, when we first talked about it, it was he wanted he was very clear that he wanted it to be like My Little Pony because it was a little girl's imaginary friend. So he imagined like My Little Pony or, and then he steered me towards like the, the little Pegasus uh, in uh, Hercules and in Fantasia, mm -hmm. there was little chubby horses. Oh yeah. So he saw it very cute. And uh, then he changed his mind on the size a few times. I asked like one time he, Happy was going to be as big as a dog and another time he was like oh. a parrot. And so I kind of followed his logic, but I kept, I, I sketched out, I did a full, fully realized drawing of the little pony version with the big wings. And you could see it in, I think there's actually in, you had a copy of Happy, I think yeah. it ended up in that edition. Um, but it, uh, it, if I showed it to my sons who I like to get their opinion on things and they were like, mm, you know, and I liked it. It was charming, but something was missing for me. And so... Grant seemed to like it on the first round, but I started thinking on it and I came up with, um, I think Grant had suggested some different animals I could consider and I think donkey stood out to me. So I sat down and made a uni I made the donkey, but then I gave him the unicorn horn and the, and the wings and uh, my son named it a Unipixis. Unipixis. And um, so he was, and then I bet as soon as I drew that version of Happy, like I knew I had it. And so I drew some more 
like I did some expression shots and things like that to see if he would perform, and he did. He just came to life right right there on the page for me. So you both so, embraced it. And as soon as, as soon as I showed Gar, uh, showed Grant, he was like, "That's perfect. You know, that's that's the one." So that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. You have a yeah. There's also another another one of your creation, if I may say so. That uh, that that you, you we should talk about. It's your take on Wolverine. Mm. Uh, you did a, a pretty pretty good take on Wolverine if you ask me but uh, it was a bestseller for the for the the, the, the first few months of uh, as, as long as it run, ran so there is a, a good story tremendous art and you had a vision for the for the character yeah can you can you elaborate I loved Wolverine from the time I was a little boy like uh, I think one of my first Marvel comics I ever started collecting was X-Men And I think I started actually with that Wolverine miniseries that Frank Miller illustrated. It was one of the first things I read. I love the covers. Um, Wolverine to me is a, a character I've always identified with because he's small and he, and I love that he didn't look like all the other superheroes. And that was important to me when I was illustrating him to really bring that quality, those qualities that make Logan unique into the comic. And so. I thought about the fact that he is only five foot three. I thought about the fact that he has this adamantium skeleton that he has to live with and that he's got this healing factor is the only reason that he's still going. And he has been through all this tragedy and his idea of a good time is to go sit in a bar and fight when he's not, you know, because he's, you know, the, the nature of a Wolverine, the animal, Uh, from what she gets his name is that they're small and they're isolated and they're ornery and like they're really mean they're, they're also tough as hell they'll fight they'll track you down uh, if you if you leave the fight the Wolverine won't like the IRS yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he um, to me that was an important aspect of, of who he was and I really wanted to bring that to the comic but at the time The movie had just come out, and they wanted the comics and the movies to look alike. So I was one of many people drawing Wolverine, and um, you know, because John Cassidy was drawing him in the X Men, and there was an Ultimate version of him at the time, and the Ultimate version had a goatee, and and then other artists draw him kind of lanky, and I was drawing him very squat. I always thought he would be very squat because one, he's got a small frame, and two his uh, adamantium skeleton is like carrying extra weight all the time and if you know anything about bodybuilding which I have a weird education in it because I've drawn from muscle magazines my life to learn anatomy yeah. um, that when you lift a weight what you're doing is you're tearing your muscles up yeah. and that's why they hurt afterwards for a little while because when they heal they heal larger so if, if you've ever carried a bag around all day you know how the toll that takes on your body well if you could never set your bag down if you could never put down that extra weight you would because it's within your bone right it would be painful and you would constantly be you know wolverine's got a healing factor but he's not free from pain you know his body isn't pain free it just heals you know and i think that that would be part of the reason he looked like the way he did when i drew him he is kind of tired Angry. probably has trouble sleeping You know, I just think about this guy a lot. And that's a vision. That, that's that's why you, you just don't draw the Wolverine. Well, you, the, you you figure I live in his head. You know, and, and 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 but that's the thing. And I loved him so much, and I still do. I think he's a great character. And but he's you know, but he'd have bags under his eyes, and he'd be kind of cranky. And you know, I just think about he smokes, and so you know, even with the the, the healing factors probably working overtime, just keeping his liver and lungs going. Yeah. You know. So I, I just I love that character. I think he stands apart. And then at the time too, like Marvel didn't want him to smoke anymore. And you know, so some of the things that I grew up that was uh, made him. You came at the wrong time. I just because there yeah. was some editorial interferences. Yeah, I mean, it's Marvel. It's Marvel's character. At the end of the day, I can't tell Marvel like what to do with their character. It was my job to follow the rules because it was their character and they were trusting me with them. I just know that there was an era an era with these characters that, um, you know, Frank Miller's version, Sam Keith's version, Barry Windsor Smith's version, they were all yeah. unique to that artist. And I thought that Classic. was, my, I thought it was my time. You know, I thought I could do my, bring my thing to the, to Wolverine. And, um, you know, at first I got a lot of support, but when minds changed, I wasn't as quick to adapt as I probably 
should have been, but I really felt passionate about what I was well, doing. At least you had a small run, but a meaningful one. I liked, I, it's I, not I, the size that matters, you see? <laughs> yeah, right. Like Just like Wolverine. <laughs> um, and Greg's story was fantastic. And I oh, loved, yeah. And I loved working with Greg. Before his time. Like, yeah. yeah. You, you've worked with a lot of visionaries. So Absolutely. So about, still about the artist. The artist condition can be pretty tough, actually. Yeah. It's always, we, we fantasize about it because I... I, I, I draw like shit, but uh, <laughs> it's a solitary one. It's uh, yeah. crazy deadlines. It's true. Like uh, not being able to go 100% because of the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, this is the war of art. And uh, can you tell us about your struggle? Maybe your, your biggest struggle ever on a page or on a panel? Or do you remember being so frustrated at it? It is, it is a very uh, physically taxing thing to push through a deadline, uh, especially if you're trying to keep a quality of the work up. Um, I remember Transmetropolitan was uh, particularly challenging at certain times and so was Ballistic because they're staring me in the face right now. I'm going back down memory lane, but um, because they had environments that were so crucial to the story and the atmosphere that if you skimped on them, it would fail the story. Ballistic was a, a, a world where it was important that you understood uh, the scope of the city and the intric intric Intricate. The, the intricacies. intricacies. There's the word. The intricacies of the city because uh, Butch was a mechanic and he lived in this world where he could fix these things. Um, so if they didn't look complicated, then Butch wouldn't have a purpose. And in the city, if you didn't feel like you could get lost in it, then you would not relate to a spider's obsession with it. So these things were... There are main characters in the cities in your, in your comic books. Yes. In most of your comic books, the main character of Transmetropolitan to me is the city. Thank you. Uh, one of the main uh, characters. And yeah, considering the background, you must have... Yeah, I mean, I, it's enjoyable for me to create something where I can put that level of detail in. It's just there's sometimes you just have to... Good enough has to be. And I've become something of a perfectionist in my last few years where... And by no means am I saying my work is perfect, but I have a harder you time. Wish it to be. Well, I can't. I have a harder time letting it be substandard. I can't just let it. I can't hack it out anymore. And I, not that I ever really did, but I used to be a lot faster and a lot more um, dedicated to just getting it done. And now it's it really matters to me as I get older that I ink my own work now. Um, I want it to be good. I want to leave something good behind. Well, this is a perfect transition. Can we talk about your next project, Oliver? Sure. That you've talked about back three years ago. You were already at yeah, it. I've been at it for so, longer than that. Yeah. Well, that, that's really it's, good. It's, so. it's, been in, it's been stop start for a long time. I just, I'm dedicated this year to make sure that I get it out. Well, plus, uh, as uh, we talk, uh, we can see, uh, we will see, uh, we'll add them uh, a special page of the work that you've been giving us an exclusive look. So okay. First, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for it. And can you describe the work? Can you tell it's us what's Oliver, challenging? And Oliver is a, it's, it's a post-apocalyptic London, and it's the story of Oliver Twist. All the characters are there, but it's set in a post-apocalyptic London um, in an alternate timeline. Um, where there's been a great war and the uh, there was a clone army and the people that were the clones uh, are now like living in an irradiated out London and into this this little boy comes and it's Gary Wooda is the writer he wrote the movie Rogue One and the Book of Eli and he's written episodes of the show Rebels for Star Wars and just wrote the Last Jedi adaptation for Marvel so Gary's very talented and uh, we've been friends for a long time and working on this project. It's an adaptation of the screenplay that he wrote 10, 15 years ago. So it's, uh, it's been a real labor of love for both of us. He's been very, very patient. And, uh, but the reward for that patience is showing in the work because it is absolutely one of the most complex and uh, most pleasurable things I've ever drawn. You've shown me the page and I feel like, and I, I to be honest, I didn't think that you could do this, but I think you are still out, out. Um, well, you, you are upping your style. Thank you. Th th there is another level. Um, That's well, Derek Robertson, one hundred and ten percent. So, is, well, it, is it what is it? The inking, the way it's you time. It's just patience. You know, it's actually getting it. You know, having the choice of changing something if it's not working, having the uh, ability to draw every little brick and uh, learn new techniques because there's time to try things that might fail. 
Um, I'm in issue three, it's raining really hard and lightning is happening and I'm learning new ways to bring rain and lightning into a comic in a way that I haven't been able to do because I've didn't been bringing have, fire into the comic ever <laughs> since you were born, I, but I didn't have lightning. <laughs> well, I have tools that I didn't have 10 years ago, you know, with things I can do on Photoshop to accent the pencil and ink work, you know, to make it a step deeper, you know, I, all these little things that I can do. And I have an amazing colorist, uh, Diego Rodriguez, who's just, Hola. who's just doing incredible work as usual. He he colored all the ballistic, and I love working with him. Yeah, so. the hot time. <laughs> <laughs> I can I cannot imagine the the night he put up coloring the city of of ballistic. Wow. He did a great job. Wow. He brings my stuff to life. Wow, it's a it's it's really really cool. Um, the last word is for you. Or the last words are for you. Oh, okay. Uh, How was your time? Uh, thanks for an incredible time in France. It's been fun getting to know you. And, uh, oh, well. This is uh, one of the most you know, unique experiences I've had in France, being out in Chamont rather than in the city, like in Paris. Or, and I was in Angoulême last time. So every time I come to France, it, it becomes uh, more deeply embedded in my heart. So I had oh. a... It's so a pleasure thanks. to be embedded in your heart Thank within you. France. <laughs> <For me. laughs> Maybe the last word could be in French then. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, je ne look look par- at the camera. Look at je ne parle très bien français. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Derek. I've been practicing that all week. <laughs>